But we're basically going to talk about the Andrew Beck, and I know Mark's probably going to gone through most of this with you guys, and this is just sort of a kind of a recap uh, for me. Uh, the Andrew Beck suction cannula is a 22 French expandable tip cannula that goes up to 48 French when the uh, tip's expanded. When the pump started, it creates a negative pressure vortex around 80 parts per million with a flow rate of anywhere from 3 to 5 liters per minute. As we know, it's an extracorporeal blood filter system. We have to give the blood back or we'll exsanguinate the patient pretty quickly. The reinfusion cannula returns the blood back to the body through the venous system. Uh, so this is basically veno-veno bypass uh, without the oxygenator. And this allows us uh, to maintain hemodynamic stability uh, through the contiguous uh, autologous reperfusion of blood back to the patient. And forgive me if Mark's kind of already gone through this, but we'll want to take a, a step to kind of go through what we as clinicians think about uh, when we're using the Angiovac. And this is the whole setup that we're seeing here. And sorry, does my mouse show up on this or? Yes, it does. Okay, perfect. So when we're looking at uh, taking care of the patient, we have to think about where the, the uh, aspect of the clot or the vegetation that we're going after is that allows us to think about what our access sites are going to be. And as I said, for the majority of these procedures, we're doing veno-veno uh, access. So in this uh, picture, the representation that we're showing here, the access is in the right IJ through a 26 French sheath. And that's where the angiovac cannula is going to go into. And this is the access we use mostly when we're going after right heart structures, such as tricuspid vegetations, sometimes clot in transit in the right heart, or uh, vascular surgeons are going after iliocable thrombus. The blood is then taken back through, washed through saline into the filter, and then the blood goes through the centrifugal pump and is returned back to the patient through the venous system, in this representation through uh, a reinfusion cannula that's put into the femoral venous system. Uh, the reinfusion cannula size is anywhere from 16 to 20 French. For the majority of the cases that I perform, we use an 18 French reinfusion cannula. Uh, the different uh, arrangements that can be made, you can do femoral femoral access. This is when we're trying to go up and getting tumbling clot in the right heart or if we're going into an SVC. You can even do veno veno access through the bilateral IJ without having to go through the femoral veins. So realistically, you can kind of utilize any combination of these uh, uh, access sites. And in the unstable patient, uh, you can even splice in VA ECMO into your return circuit so you can maintain hemodynamic stability in an unstable patient as well as providing oxygenation. So this is kind of the crux of how we think about these cases is to have this as our starting point, kind of figure out where we're going after and figure out what our access sites are going to be. Uh, we've recently done our first LV case. I don't want to get in too involved in that, but in order for us to, you know, to have suction uh, aspiration from the left ventricle and to maintain stability while we're dropping the cardiac output, we had to actually do AA access, so return the blood through the femoral arterial system mm -hmm. to maintain stability. Mm -hmm. But for the majority, 99% of cases, venous-venous access is going to be where we're going. And kind of one of the pearls that my perfusionists uh, like to remind me is to really get the ACT up before we go on pump. So generally we're running the ACTs greater than 250 to 300 seconds. And though I'm an interventional cardiologist, I do a lot of work with our perfusionists. Uh, both, they're involved in our TAVR program, our STEMI program, and obviously with the Angiovac program. And so I asked them when I was giving this talk, and I've given talk to other perfusion uh, schools, what are some of the, the things that you want me to remind your colleagues about? So one of the things, these are the things that the perfusions kind of came up with, which is that make sure that they understand this is not a heparin-coated device. So really we want to drive the ACT up, you know, over 250 to 300. And then the filter is the big thing. The filter has four prongs at the top of it. And the, a quarter-sized meniscus of air is okay. This allows us to trap the thrombus so make sure it doesn't go through the prongs and back to the patient. And the bubble trap system will capture small bubbles uh, so it's not going to return to the patient and cause a lot of problems. However, a large amount of air, as in any perfusion circuit, is bad. They want to make sure I, I capitalize that bad for, for that one. <laughs> and then the other thing is uh, if we're angiovacking and we get no flow, this usually means that the cannula is up against an obstruction. And we'll kind of go through with certain cases of what we do in that, in that situation, but it's not one of the things where we always want to turn the flows down. It's one of the things where we want to have a constant interaction and conversation with the physician who's utilizing the angiovac and our uh, imaging uh, people, the echocardiographer who's uh, watching what we're doing. Hey, where are you? Are you up against the wall? Are you up against an obstruction? Because if we are up against the obstruction, we obviously want to stay on flows because we've captured it. We want it to work its way into the cannula so it doesn't flick off and embolize. So really having an ongoing conversation. That'll be 
kind of an overall theme on this is to always have a conversation with everybody that's in the room that's participating in these procedures. So Angiovec, you know, I like to say that this was a, a, a device that was designed by two cardiothoracic surgeons at Mass General as basically to, to be a device used for pulmonary emboli, for patients with high-risk PE who were high-risk to go uh, under surgical thrombectomy procedures. What we found is once the Angiovac got into the hands of, of uh, clinicians around the country and around the world, that they started using it for other indications, such as iliocable thrombus. I know you guys were just talking about some cases, uh, whether it be secondary to congenital thrombophilias or from IVC filters that have uh, thrombosed. IVC thrombosis with renal vein extension, SVC thrombosis, and we'll kind of go through that, right atrial thrombus. Pulmonary embolism, though, though it was created for pulmonary embolism, early on the success rate for the use of uh, the angiovec device in its current iteration for uh, pulmonary embolism is less than 15%. So really that indication is kind of fallen by the wayside. Uh, thrombus attached to intracardiac devices, including PFO closure devices, as well as for uh, congenital heart uh, circuits is what it's been used for. So we, first thing I want to talk about is right heart thrombus. Obviously as a cardiologist, the heart's close to my mind always. The presence of free-floating right heart thrombus is a predictor of hemodynamic decompensation, cardiac arrest, and mortality, even in patients that are treated with heparin. In patients who present to the hospital with massive pulmonary emboli, if we look for it, whether we do echo or CT imaging, 4 to 18 percent of those patients will have evidence of a free-floating right heart thrombus at the time of uh, uh, their hospitalization. And when they have both a pulmonary emboli and right heart thrombus, their mortality in the hospital is anywhere from 27 to 44 percent. So these are the sickest of the sick patients. Well, how do we treat these patients? Well, we could just anticoagulate them alone and hope that they don't embolize. However, that does you know, increase the risk that if it embolizes, that they could decompensate. And then we don't really have a lot of good therapies emergently other than to give them IV thrombolytics. We can give them IV thrombolytics, but then we have to take on the bleeding risk. We're giving a large dose of IV thrombolytics into a peripheral IV. So we have to give usually 100 milligrams to get that to circulate and to get it to where we want it to go. In the clinical trials, the bleeding risks, major bleeding risks around 15%. In actual practice, based on registry data, it's about 20%. The risk of intracranial hemorrhage is around 2 to 3%. And the other concern is that if we give IV thrombolytics and we have incomplete dissolution of clot and that, that part embolizes, we could take a stable situation where we have clot already in the pulmonary vasculature. We've now embolized additional clot. We've now taken a stable situation and made it unstable. The mainstay of therapy has been for these patients to go on for surgical uh, thrombectomy or embolectomies. However, in unstable patients, even in the best of hands, uh, based on the literature, we're having a 40% mortality, in-hospital mortality for those patients. And in stable patients, 25 to 30% mortality. And again, this is in published literature for high volume centers. So you can see that the majority of centers around the, the country are probably not the high volume centers. These mortality rates may be even higher. And obviously, the mortality rates are higher in patients with concomitant pulmonary embolism that are already complicated by RV dysfunction. And this may be a sweet spot where mechanical thrombectomy uh, may play a role. So this is a case presentation. Uh, this is a 65-year-old male uh, with diabetes who was transferred uh, from a, another institution for further management of worsening dyspnea and lower extremity edema. On presentation in that hospital, he was in an atrial tachyarrhythmia with a rate, rapid ventricular rate, heart rates in the 150s to 160s. Every time they tried to slow his heart rate down with a calcium channel blocker or beta blocker, he became hemodynamically unstable. On presentation, he was found to be in uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, acute kidney injury, and profound thrombocytopenia with a platelet count less than 20,000. Upon arrival, we emergently got a CT scan of the torso just to make sure, and we found no evidence of widely metastatic disease. And an echocardiogram was performed and showed severe biventricular dysfunction with an EF of 20%. And hopefully this is projecting. I know this is a little bit blurry, but if you take a look here, this is the right atrium and the right ventricle, and the left ventricle is tacking away. But you can see right in here, when this is playing, let me play it again, there's basically a tumbling thrombus in the right atrium that's going across the tricuspid valve. Yep. We'll so. See it. Play it again. Did we freeze? I can't hear him. Is he there? 
Have we lost them? Somebody? Yeah, I think this is an abnormal delay. There's there's some. All right, you guys are you guys are still with me? Yes, we got you back. Okay, perfect. So what you can see here is uh, we're in the hybrid operating room, and we did an angiovac to get rid of this clot. And one of the things that we wanted to discuss here in this case was that this patient has a tumbling thrombus in the right atrium. We presume that he also had concomitant pulmonary emboli with five ventricular dysfunction. And one of the things with you know severe pulmonary emboli and right, and right ventricular dysfunction is that if you intubate these patients, you guys have probably seen this, that they, they have a tendency to, to crash on you. You take away their adrenergic tone as well as their preload to their heart, they become hemodynamically unstable. And we've seen this a lot where they actually start to code. So we actually did this under max sedation without intubating the patient. And we used trans uh, uh, thoracic guidance instead of transesophageal guidance. And the clot was big enough that we could see it. So what you don't see is over here on this other side of the table, it's the, sur the surgeon that I work with as well as my echocardiographer doing surface echo. And when we got in there, we went from an IJ approach. As soon as we went on flows, we lost, we lost flow. Yep. And so we waited for two minutes, let the clot kind of work its way in the cannula. And after two minutes, I just started to gently advance my cannula and retract it. And we could see that the clot was moving just on transthoracic with the cannula. So we knew that the clot had worked its way into the cannula. And I brought it out through the gore drosial sheath. And you can see it basically about a third of the clot was in the cannula with two thirds still out. And everything kind of came out. And here's the, the, the tumbling thrombus. It was just under 10 centimeters. And you can see that the, the, the width of this was basically the, almost the width of the internal diameter of the angiovac cannula. And this is the uh, post transthoracic echo just to prove that we had re gotten rid of the clot uh, that was there. So I think this is kind of a, a nice case to, to go through just a couple of the hemodynamic principles, which is that the patients with PE with underlying cardiac dysfunction, the, these are still procedures we can do with max sedation uh, in the operating room and really get rid of this clot. So kind of continuing on with the thrombectomy uh, theme, the second case, this is a 65-year-old female who's two months after uh, bypass surgery. She has end-stage renal disease, and she's on dialysis. And after bypass surgery, she was discharged with a right-side permacath for dialysis access. Well, she got admitted with MRSA bacteremia. It was suspected that this was a line infection, and the permacath was removed. However, the patient remained bacteremic despite line removal and IV antibiotic therapy. And this was nine days after admission. She was still bacteremic. At this point, our infectious disease uh, colleagues uh, recommended getting a TEE to rule out endocarditis. And this is a T trans uh, esophageal image. And what you can see here, just to orient people, this is the right atrium, intraatrial septum, and then this is the SVC. And what we can see here is a large mobile thrombus in the SVC. You can see there's a mobile component right here at the SVC RA junction. Yeah. So in this instance, what was presumed was going on was that she developed a large SVC thrombus and that the thrombus was actually the ongoing nutus for her continuing bacteremia despite the line being removed. And we're seeing more and more of these as people are being discharged from the hospital with more and more lines such as PIC lines or permacasts or metaports. Um, so in this instance, we ended up bringing her for an angiovac and because we were angiovacing the SVC, we decided to come from below so coming up through the IVC, it's a straight shot from the right, through the right atrium up to the SVC. And this is what we're seeing here. Here's the angiovac cannula. This is uh, the second generation. So we have the, uh, the balloon tip, and we're coming up, working our way through the right atrium up into the SVC and just kind of debulking the clot a little bit at a time. And here's another transesophageal image. Now for these... Okay. Can you text him and tell him that, uh, that the video messes up his sound? So he needs to play the, yeah. Say that again. It's cutting his mic, yeah, because it's his, his overloading his so he's computer. He's going to play the video and then make the commentary. Right. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Dr. Zlotnick. Dr. Zlotnick. 
Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but what happens is when you play those videos, um, you, your mic is cutting out. And so if, if and I, I hate to ask you to do this, but if you could go back to yes. that video and don't play the video, but let, it, let us see the video play, but then narrate after it has played, because we really missed pretty much everything that you said from that point forward until it just gotcha. came back on. All right, so it's just an issue with the, uh, perfect. So I'll play the video. And so what, what we're seeing here, this is the, to, to kind of go through, this is the right atrium, and here's your SVC. And what we can see here is basically a large clot, and you can see a mobile component, oh, sorry about that, right here at the SVC RA junction. Mm -hmm. And again, this is something that we're seeing more and more of as people are leaving the hospital with different types of lines, such as pick lines, metaports, permacasts. So we're seeing more and more of this. And even though the line was removed, the ongoing bacteremia was being caused by this persistent uh, clot that was sitting in the SVC. So this clot is, uh, is super infected with the MRSA, which was giving her persistent bacteremia. And what I was showing in this video is the, all right. What I'm showing in this video is basically the angiovac cannula coming up through the IVC, through the right atrium, and then here's the balloon tip with the funnel, and basically debulking the thrombus in the SVC. And after we got done, this is what the filter looked like. So we got a lot of oh my material God. thrombus, and we were able to debulk. Now again, what I was saying for these cases, this is not clot that we're gonna be able to readily see on a transthoracic echocardiogram. So for these patients, we have to intubate them and use TE imaging for us to see. But for the majority of our SVC patients, actually for all the SVC patients that I've done, we've always gone from the from below, intubate with TE imaging. And happy to report that 24 hours after this procedure, she was uh, bacteremic free, her cultures had cleared. Mm -hmm. And she was discharged home on post-operative day five with IV antibiotics and a Shiley catheter from a di different access site. Sure. So again, you know, the one thing that the infectious disease doctors we work very closely with because a lot of the angiovacs, the majority of the angiovacs that I do are for some sort of ongoing bacteremia, whether it be from endocarditis or from, from clot. Uh, that getting source control is a major, major uh, 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 thing that we need to do for these patients in order to allow the antibiotics and the medical therapy uh, uh, to clear up the remaining infection. So if we can't get source control, the antibiotics that they're giving uh, are not going to get these patients bacteremic free. And we want to really get Get these patients before they seed other areas of the of the body. Mm -hmm. but with that, kind of transition over to infectious endocarditis, and you know, kind of just going through the uh, pathophysiology of this is that normal heart valves are usually resistant to clot and infection forming, and that's because of the endothelial uh, uh, layer. The endothelial cells really prevent platelet aggregation. However, when injury occurs to the valve tissue, then you basically get uh, the subendothelial collagen layer getting exposed. And that's where the platelet and fiber aggregation can occur with bacterial seeding. So what happens, bacterial seeds on that, that collagen layer, and then the platelet fibrin aggregates around it and creates sort of a force field, so to speak. And that excludes our host antibodies and our immune system as well as the antibiotics that we're given so that that infection can continue to run rampant. Uh, things like, you know, organisms such as Staph aureus can directly contribute to the valve damage. Uh, as well as bacteria can contribute to vegetation proliferation. So really what we're trying to do is, with these vegetations formed, is we need to get rid of that platelet fibrin cap and allow our antibiotics and our body's immune system to, and the antibi uh, our antibodies to get down there, be, be, uh, beyond that layer to where the infection is and really try to uh, allow that to clear the infection. Unfortunately, uh, the IV drug use is, uh, and the opioid epidemic uh, is running rampant in our country as well as around the world. IV drug use has doubled over just the last 10 years, and there's been a 12-fold increase in hospitalizations amongst people who use intravenous drug use. And again, in just the last 10 years, the cases of uh, infective endocarditis from IV drug use has gone up from 15% of hospitalized cases to 30%. Uh, so this is something that we're seeing, unfortunately, more and more of. 
The majority of right-side infective endocarditis uh, do occur in the intravenous drug use population. About 10 to 25 percent of all cases of in infective endocarditis are from the right-sided uh, uh, structures, whether it be the tricuspid, pulmonic, RVOT. If a patient with IV drug use presents with a fever, 13 percent of them will have evidence of infective endocarditis on admission. If they're bacteremic on admission, 41 percent of them will have evidence of infective endocarditis on admission. And clinical manifestations of, of infective endocarditis are fever and sepsis, with septic pulmonary emboli being the big uh, feature because, again, the majority of these patients are developing vegetations on the right side of valves, which are mobile, breaking off, going to the lungs. So these patients will present with chest pain, dyspnea, a cough, hemoptysis. And what we're really concerned about, and we've seen this, is that these patients then trash their lungs. And I hate to use that term, but their lungs become so filled with abscess that even if we can get the heart cleared, the lungs are gone, and we have no ability to bring these patients back. So really, the, the sweet spot for these patients is to get to them early before their lungs have been riddled with abscess and before they've lost their lung function. And for me, you know, when we see these patients, we bring our pulmonologists on very early on to kind of help us to understand what's the underlying lung function, what's going on uh, from the standpoint of their ventilator requirements, and is this somebody that we can recover from a lung standpoint uh, before we go in and start tackling their heart. Well, treatment obstacles in this pa patient population are, are difficult. One thing is that these patients are non-adherent to treatment and non-compliant with medical follow-up. The good news is the overall mortality for right side infective endocarditis is anywhere from 10 to 30 percent, and 70 to 80 percent of these cases will resolve with antibiotic therapy alone. These patients do require multidisciplinary management, and I don't mean that just from a physician standpoint, but from a nursing standpoint, social work standpoint, substance abuse counseling, it really does uh, take uh, a lot of people coming together to treat these patients. The indications for surgical management, uh, you know, historically have been patients who've developed refractory right heart failure, secondary to severe tricuspid regurgitation, despite medical therapy. If patients have had sustained infection caused by a difficult to treat organism or a lack of uh, response to appropriate antibiotic therapy, and when we think of difficult to treat organisms, the ones that we think the most are, are MRSA and uh, uh, fungal organisms. If the vegetation is greater than one to two centimeters, especially if it's greater than two centimeters, because this is associated with a tenfold increase in in-hospital mortality risk. And obviously if they have recurrent septic pulmonary emboli, despite uh, optimal medical therapy, these are patients that are at high risk to, uh, to uh, have adverse outcomes in their lungs. When I talk to my surgical colleagues, I ask them, well, what are the surgical principles to treating these patients when you're thinking about taking these patients to the OR? And what they constantly tell me is they want to radically debride the vegetations in the infective tissue, but they want to avoid uh, the implantation of prosthetic material after they debride. And this is especially true in the intravenous drug use population because they don't know at that time if the patients are going to stop the high-risk activities that got them there in the first place. Mm -hmm. and what they don't want to do is have these patients come back with prosthetic valve endocarditis because that that becomes a much bigger issue to treat down the line. So ideally, they'd like to perform a vagectomy or even if they have to, a complete valvectomy without leaving any prosthetic material behind because the majority of patients, especially young patients, can live without their tricuspid valve for, for a while. They may have a little bit of heart failure symptoms, but this is not something that's going to overwhelmingly uh, uh, cause mortality in them. Then bring them back after the fact after they've cleaned up, they stopped using their high-risk activities, and then if they need to, either proceed on to a tricuspid valve repair or replacement at that point. Ideally, they like to delay surgery in these patients until the, sterile, the cultures are sterile, just to decrease the risk of, of, of having uh, any type of surgical uh, material become infected. When we look at the historical literature, and again in high-volume centers, the complications of perioperative surgical management in these patients, their surgical mortality is still anywhere from 6 to 10%. Also, some of the other issues that my surgical colleagues like to tell me is that, hey, these are patients that are withdrawing from opioids. At the same time, I'm trying to control their post-operative pain. So that becomes a, a very uh, 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 dicey interplay uh, in the post-operative uh, period. They also have issues with the respiratory status, especially in patients with septic pulmonary emboli, trying to manage the ventilator uh, after an open heart procedure. And then obviously, complete surgical valvectomy can result in high morbidity from right heart failure in these patients. And I think this is really where angiovac is taken off because the goals of therapy for angiovac is what we want to do is reduce the vegetative load on the valve or in the right heart. 
And this allows us to decrease the infectious burden, get rid of that platelet fibrin uh, cap on the, on the vegetation, and allow the antibiotics that are, are being given to, to clear up the remaining infection. So we're not trying to go in there and completely clear the valve of all the infection. We want to get debulk. We like to say that a, a successful debulking is if we can get 60% or more of the vegetative load off the valve. And what we're really trying to do is just strip that platelet fibrin cap and allows the, the body's immune system and the antibiotics to really resolve the rest of it. By getting in there and doing that, we also want to decrease further valve destruction as well as decrease risk of further septic pulmonary uh, emboli. So the way I like to talk to my colleagues about is that what we're doing with Angiovac is we're really trying to take a patient who may have been surgical, do a, a procedure, and then continue to treat them medically. So this doesn't replace the need for antibiotics or replace the duration of antibiotic therapy, but is actually an adjunct to medical therapy with antibiotics. And ideally, what we'd like to do is be able to recover these patients. And then if, again, they're not using, they're, they stop doing the high-risk activities that got them involved in the first place, and they start having morbidity from right heart failure from severe TR, then 6, 12, 24 months later, that's when we think about come, bringing them back and doing a tricuspid valve repair or replacement. So let's go through uh, just a quick study. This was a couple years ago. This was a, a single uh, center retrospective study of 33 patients that they used Angiovac for right-side infective endocarditis. And what they did was they looked at their historical institutional mortality of right-side endocarditis, which was 28%. So a little bit at the upper end of uh, the published data. And what they did was they used Angiovac and found a 61% average reduction in the vegetative size on the post-procedure echo. 100% procedural survival with three patients proceeding on to elective tricuspid valve repair or replacement for severe TR, and they had 90% survival to discharge. So to me, this is the data that we use for our own internal quality uh, uh, pro uh, assessment program to say what we're doing for our patients, this is the kind of data that we want to match with our program. And this is uh, in line with what most institutions would want to have. So with that, bring to a case presentation. This is a 22-year-old female, past medical history remarkable for hepatitis C and heroin abuse, who was transferred from our, our county hospital. She presented with one week of flu-like symptoms. She was found to have sep uh, sepsis secondary to methicillin-sensitive staph aureus bacteremia. IV antibiotic therapy was started, and an echocardiogram was uh, performed demonstrating tricuspid valve endocarditis. She had multiple vegetations, one and a half to two and a half centimeters, with moderate tricuspid regurgitation, and she did have evidence of septic pulmonary emboli on a CT scan. So I'm going to play the TE, then I'll pause it, and we'll discuss. 22 years old. Mm -hmm. That's just sad. I think it must be a bandwidth issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, he's not even playing. Computer's blowing up. Mm -hmm. I can see it though already. You mm -hmm. see it. Mm -hmm. It's fairly high. Here. Once it gets there, it's like socked in a dryer if it actually runs. <laughs> can you chat with him and tell him we can't hear him yet? That it's uh, just so he knows. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, I can hear you. We can hear you now. All right. So it seems like every time I play a movie, the uh, we, we freeze for about 30 seconds. So I'll just wait till you guys come back. But so there's multiple. Uh, frond-like vegetations uh, attached to the tricuspid valve. So this was really where we were going after. And I'll let the next movie play, but what it'll, it'll show is the angiovac coming in from an IJ approach, so coming from the SVC into the right atrium, coming down on the tricuspid valve. So I'm going to show that now, so I'm sure we're going to pause. Yeah, I see it. See it coming in? I see him. Are you guys still with me? Yes. Yes, sir. All right, perfect. So this is our the filter afterwards, and these are the multiple frond-like vegetations that we were able to get after we debulked. And I'm going to show the post uh, transesophageal echo uh, pic. Dave, if you can hear me, you can. You're still breaking up. Gotta love technology. 
Yes. And live shows. <laughs> right. And we're live. <laughs> Always okay. happens live, right? This is live. Always live. Go big, go home. There you go. You're back. All right, you guys are back? We got you back. Yeah. Yep. So we were able to debulk by 90% of the vegetation. All we had left was that just that linear uh, vegetation. Uh, so we deemed this to be a very successful angiovac. And actually, right after we uh, angiovac 24 hours later, again, her culture is cleared post-procedure. She remained in the hospital, obviously, given the high risk. Nobody was going to discharge her with a PICC line. So she remained in the hospital, got, received a course of IV antibiotic therapy. Uh, she was started on methadone for management of her poly substance abuse. She got social work support and substance abuse counseling. And she had outpatient follow-up in the methadone clinic, and she was discharged home. I actually saw her uh, this summer, one year after the angiovac, and she is doing very well. She uh, has employment, has a stable uh, relationship. And she's mad at me because uh, since the angiovac, she's put on 90 pounds. Very good. <laughs> we like to, uh, to say that this is a, a, a success story that we're giving these patients an opportunity to change their life around. Now, one of the things, uh, this is what the second generation angiovac device, and I think Mark kind of went over the, the design changes between angiovac 2 and angiovac gen 3. But I just wanted to kind of point out what we were working with, which was basically a 20 degree bend. Now, in this schematic, it looks like the 20 degree bend will be just enough to get us to the tricuspid valve, but in, uh, in actual practice, that 20 degree bend gets us right into the IVC and not near the tricuspid valve. So we had to figure out ways that we could make this do what we want or go where we want it to go. And so two different techniques that, that uh, were developed was one where we basically suture, put a suture in at the tip funnel, and then that suture would be externalized. And as you pull that suture, that would basically pull the angiovac and give it more of a 90 degree bend. The, uh, I never did that. The technique that I used was to, to, to do a second stick in the IJ and put a gooseneck snare around the device and then use the snare to pull up on the device. Yeah. And I'll show you a picture or a video of that, that was a good idea. right here. Yeah, we see the snare. Yeah, we yeah. see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So. So the snare allowed us to maneuver the device, but thankfully, uh, uh, Andrew Dynamics came out with Gen 3 after uh, seeing what we've struggled with. And I think Mark kind of went over this, but basically there's a, the oversheath and there's two different cannulas. There's the C180 and the C20. Again, I just did a C20 uh, a procedure last week for an SVC thrombus. That curve is about what we need to get up, you know, straight through the IVC in the right, right atrium and up to the SVC. But for the uh, endocarditis, the, especially the tricuspid valve, the C180 is really kind of almost, I hate to use revolutionary, but it's been, you know, a godsend for us. It's really made the procedure easier and faster. And so as it comes out through the sheath, we can actually control the amount of bend that the, the cannula makes anywhere from around 60 all the way to 180 degrees. And unfortunately, I think this next uh, slide is going to have both video images as well as just still frame uh, fluoroscopic images of the C180 cannula. Um, this was a tricuspid endocarditis case that we recently did uh, in this patient. And so you can see the, the uh, vegetations on the tricuspid valve coming in from an IJ approach. And you can see here is the oversheath. And then here's the C180 coming out. And in this instance, we're making about a 70 to 80 degree bend, which takes us right onto the anterior leaflet of the tricuspid uh, valve. And we're able to rapidly debulk this. And just to show the amount of bend that we can make right here and to really kind of go after the tricuspid annulus and, and continue to debulk, this procedure time, uh, we looked at this. We were, uh, had the angiovac catheter in the patient for less than 14 minutes. And our stick to closure time was less than 45 minutes with this device. So really uh, made it quicker. And as I like to tell my fellows, the longer patients on the table, the more chance for complications. So we don't want to rush through these procedures, but at the same time, be able to do these patients, you know, these uh, uh, quickly uh, will, I think, in, in long term, reduce the risks to our patients. And I'm not going to, I'll just, you know, pause that video, but we had a rapid debulking, and you can see that the filter, we had a lot of the material in the wow. filter afterwards. Wow. Everybody and goes, this was wow. the, uh, we we'll all say it, don't we? Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. So Mark was there for this, uh, the, our, our, our first, uh, first angiovac gen three case. So 
it's a little bit of that. So kind of moving on, one of the other things that we, we treat a lot is device lead infections. So device lead infection rates are anywhere from 1% to 20%. Mortality rates are anywhere from 30 to 60% if it's treated with antibiotics alone. And 13 to 33% if uh, you give antibiotic therapy as well as removal of the lead. When I'm talking about device leads, I'm talking about pacemakers, bi-V, ICD, defibrillator leads. So historically, if a vegetation is greater than one centimeter, surgical thoracotomy for removal of the hardware is performed to decrease the risk of septic embolization. However, if you think about in our, our population, especially the aging population, who's getting pacemakers and defibrillators? It's usually more the elderly. And these are high-risk patients uh, to bring back to do surgical thoracotomies uh, and sternotomies on. So percutaneous lead removal has been developed as a safe and efficacious uh, uh, alternative to doing open surgical procedures. However, in patients who have large uh, vegetations, the risk of septic pulmonary embolization is anywhere from 34 to 55%. And this is really where angiovac-assisted uh, lead removal uh, may play a role. So the Heart Rhythm Society and the European Heart uh, Rhythm Association recommends complete device and lead removal in patients with definitive cardiac implantable device infections if they have valvular endocarditis, lead endocarditis, and sepsis, if they have a pocket infection, if they have valvular endocarditis, even if there's no definitive uh, evidence of lead involvement, or if there's an occult gram-positive bacteremia that we, we can't identify. So this takes us into a case. This is a 28-year-old male with mitochondrial disorder, Crohn's disease, and paroxysmal syncope, secondary to high-grade AV block. He was having such debilitating syncope, uh, it was probably vasovagal, but because of uh, these profound syncopal episodes, a dual-chamber pacemaker was placed seven years prior. He had had a metaport placed, excuse me, for infusions for his mitochondrial disorder, and unfortunately, he was admitted to our hospital with a staph bacteremia. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show the TEE, and I'll kind of point out, on this TEE, you'll see a large vegetative burden, not only on the uh, pacemaker leads, but as well as a large vegetative burden on the right atrial wall, including a cystic structure. And you'll see that here. Yeah, that's not supposed to be in there. <laughs> yeah, so not, not very subtle. So... Again, we got a multidisciplinary team together, and we took a look. And again, with this, though he was a young kid, he, the mitochondrial disorder was almost mimicking such a, a neuromuscular disorder that we thought he would be a little bit higher risk for recovery after a, a sternotomy. And so what we decided to do was to do an angiovac-assisted laser lead extraction in this patient. And I'll kind of walk you through the procedure. What we ended up doing was we ended up coming from uh, below. So we did a venous-venous femoral approach came up from below using the snare, and that snare allowed us to, to torque the catheter to really get on the pacemaker leads and debulk not only the pacemaker leads, but also the right atrial wall. And this is the vegetation from the pacemaker lead, as well as that cystic structure that we were seeing on the right atrial free wall. After uh, we did that, we actually left the angiovac in the right atrium with a wire, a, a stiff wire up into the SVC while they removed the leads. If the leads caused a tear in the SVC, we would be able to quickly remove our angiovac cannula out and put up an occlusion balloon. But the reason we wanted to keep the angiovac in was that if any debris on the lead came off while they were removing it, we'd capture it in our angiovac instead of having it go to the, to the, uh, to the lungs. So that's what we did. Everything went well. We're all high-fiving afterwards until my echocardiographer says, well, hold the phone. Now that the leads are out, I can see this. And that was a mobile vegetation that was attached to the right atrial free wall that we could only see after the leads were out. And so what we did was we went back in with the angiovac. I was able to get the angiovac on that. I was able to, to get it up against the, uh, the, the tip of the angiovac, and then I used a snare, put the snare over it, cinched down, took it off the wall, and then externalized it out. And that's what it looked like after we got that out. Wow. Wow. There it is again. Now, wow. yeah. now the, the <laughs> next slide is going to show the post-procedure uh, TE, which will still show kind of a shaggy vegetation material that's uh, attached to the wall around the, the right atrium without a large uh, vegetation. Yeah, I see it. She's pointing mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So 
that we thought was an acceptable and we treat him with an antibiotics. And so he was treated with four weeks of IV antibiotics. And then one of my EP colleagues put in a leadless pacemaker, which is a micro, which is what we're seeing here, because his pacemaking uh, requirements were only about 7% of the time. And this was four weeks later. And before she put it in, she did a TEE. And this is what the right atrial wall looked like. Basically completely normal. So completely normal right atrial wall. So it just shows you that even though we're not getting complete debulking of every infectious material, we're debulking enough to allow the IV antibiotic therapy to really uh, go in and finish the job. So with the last couple minutes that I have, I thought I'd go through you know, why I think uh, programs should think about starting an angiovac program. And well, clinical benefits is that this is a minimally invasive procedure. Uh, is, it gives us the ability to treat patients who may not be surgical candidates or who may be high risk for, for surgery. Obviously, we want to decrease the risk of blood loss. We're giving the blood back to the patient, as well as no sacomial infections. And we want to avoid leaving prosthetic material behind that may become super infected. There may be economic benefits, such as decreased uh, length of stay in the hospital, as well as decreased ICU and hospital stays. So how to start an angiovac program is a question that I get asked a lot by my colleagues around the country. And I think the first thing we need to do is to identify champions in the institution, whether it be an interventional cardiologist, an interventional radiologist, vascular surgeon, CT surgeon, perfusionist, you know, somebody who's going to, uh, to champion this technology. And obviously, we need to engage our hospital leadership and administration because this is not a, uh, a light expense. And I think that anytime we start programs, uh, we need to have quality assurance uh, monitoring how the program is going, what we're doing, making sure we're doing the right things for our patients. If you're in an institution, you have to understand what is the institutional resources that I have available to me? Do I have a cath lab or IR suite or a hybrid OR that I'm gonna be planning to do these procedures in? What kind of advanced imaging do I have available to me, whether it be TE, CAT scan, MRI? And then obviously, do I have the access to perfusionists and CT surgery? And then you also, you wanna identify what are the clinical needs of my institution? So what patient population and diseases are I gonna be treating uh, and what are the, the standard of care currently, and what are the historical outcomes? Because those are going to be the benchmarks with which we're going to compare any new procedure or technology that we're using. And for me, again, collaboration is paramount. So the models that I like to use are the structural heart team for TAVR, right? This is a, when we brought multiple people, whether it be imaging, CT surgeons, interventional cardiologists, heart failure cardiologists, everybody together to kind of look at a patient together and say, what's the right decision for this patient uh, at this time. And we started developing the same teams for pulmonary embolism management as well as for cardiogenic shock. And so really we want to encourage collaboration and collegiality rather than trying to protect my turf. This is my patient, I'm gonna treat this patient. And so to me, the best interest of the patient should trump all. And then obviously we wanna have the appropriate patient selection. As uh, when I got in, Mark was kind of talking about the five things that he thinks about when he is uh, recommending angiovac. Really, we want to have a multidisciplinary evaluation and review all the imaging and understand, is this the right patient that we should be thinking about angiovac on? And get additional input. Get input from our infectious disease colleagues, our pulmonary critical care colleagues, anesthesiologists, and perfusion. Some of the high-risk cases, we all get together beforehand, and we have a, a pre-procedural huddle where we kind of think about what are all the contingency plans that we need to be thinking of if, uh, in this patient. And that's why it's nice for me as an endovascular specialist to be working side by side with, my, with one of our cardiothoracic surgeons. because We can bring a diverse skill set and resources to each case. And we have the ability to make up a contingency plan if the unexpected occurs. Are we going to convert this to an open surgical procedure? Are we going to be able to support this patient with mechanical hematomic support and ECMO? And one of the things that I would like to say is that there is a learning curve to these. You know, careful patient selection early on is going to be paramount to making sure that the program is successful right? Get, get certain cases under the belt, get to understand how the technology works, how the device works. Um, clinical support, whether it be provided by physicians around the country or, or angiodynamics is important. And physician mentorship, having somebody who's done a lot of these to be able to talk through cases, uh, to me early on in our experience was very helpful. And so we, we started our formal program in September of 2017. So we've just been a little bit over two years into our program. We've done 46 cases, 35 for the management of right-side infective endocarditis, 25 for tricuspid, RBOT vegetations, or infected SDC thrombus, nine for pacemaker ICD lead endocarditis. And we've done 11 cases for RA, RV thrombus, SVC, or pacemaker lead thrombus, one for foreign body, and one for an LV papillary fibroastoma. Mm -hmm. 
Our procedural success rate, uh, which we say is a greater than 50% reduction in either vegetation or thrombus burden by echo is 96%. We have 100% procedural survival and an 84% survival to discharge uh, with for right side infective endocarditis being 88%. So right in line with the historical data that, that we're seeing. So again, the importance of having a quality program to be able to take a look back through our, our outcomes and say, where can we be better? Where can we improve? And with that, I'll conclude. And thank you very much for your attention. Very nice, very, very nice. good. That was, that was excellent. Our online viewers are applauding as well, just so you know. Um, a couple of things I have is just one, one quick comment. If you'll send your videos in, uh, Dr. Zlotnick, we can edit the, uh, the, uh, the tape that we have so that we get your videos playing more seamlessly when people watch this later, because we'll have a post editing. It'll still live live as is, but they'll be able to watch the edited sure. video and we can fix that if you could just make sure we get that. Um, but I don't think enough is, I don't think enough is appreciated uh, in the uh, use of, uh, of uh, high dose antibiotics, especially when you're making cocktails with various different ones and the effect on the uh, kidneys, because I think that's a, uh, another huge problem. But I wanted to uh, make that comment and then uh, turn it over to Tammy first, and we'll go down the line with some discussion if you have time for that. Mm -hmm. I have one quick question. So I um, wrote down your comment that uh, about 60% is considered average uh, for vegetation removal. Are, are you going to try to get as much as you can possible? Yeah. Or is it get uh, you know a certain amount of time that you're manipulating this, and then you think that's that's enough, and let's go ahead and um, be done. Our filters full, or or what have you, uh, to decrease any kind of risk. Where, what? How did you come up with that particular uh, percentage? Yeah, again, that was just based on the historical uh, uh, you know paper from George et al. Uh, where they use 60% as their kind of benchmark. So we kind of use that. Most, for the majority of the time, we're, we're aiming for more closer to 80 to 90 percent vegetation removal. But that being said, you know, we're going with the device. We're trying to to debulk as much of the large mobile component as we can, because that's really what we're trying to do is to decrease the embolization and really kind of get rid of that platelet fibrin aggregate layer. And so when we see these, you know, after we get done with uh, debulking, we constantly will go in, we'll debulk, and then we'll, we'll retract the angioback cannula and then my echocardiographer. Uh, we'll, we'll survey the valve, and he'll let me know, okay, I still see a large vegetation. Now it's on the septal leaflet. Let's, you know, get the angio back over there. Or, hey, you know, the large com mobile component's gone. All I see is a small, fi you know, fibrin strand. I think this is enough. Then we'll go. So it's, it's constantly an interplay between myself and the echocardiographer who's, who's monitoring us with the transesophageal of what we're trying to do. So we're, we're trying to get as much of the material as we can. But that being said, if we don't have 100%. Uh, removal, we're, we're okay because what we're finding, and we're finding this a lot, is that if we can debulk 60, 70, 80 percent of that and get rid of that layer, the antibiotics are going to clear up the rest. So again, this is an adjunct to medical therapy as a replacement for doing an open surgical procedure. Right. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. And the key too is to remove that biofilm outer layer right, to go ahead of, and break the, that apart. of the right of the infection and now you've exposed it so that the antibiotics can actually get in there right. and and do something with it okay. it's a good thank question very good very good you. comments mark i've asked you so many questions i don't know that i can uh, that i can come up with a new one but i'm going to try um on the 60 to 80 percent that you're talking about um as far as making this something you would consider to be successful do you see any change in the clinical presentation based on the amount that you're able to remove both in the immediate time after the procedure and also long term to get full resolution or acceptable resolution to their sepsis? So I think what you're trying to ask is, is you know, and, and this is, is something I say is that our, the principles of angioback in these cases are we want to get to these patients early on. Right. So we want to get to these patients, you know, get try to debulk as much as we can before the vegetation and the infection is caused overwhelming tissue destruction to the underlying valve. Mm -hmm. So the problem is, is how patient, when and how patients present, right? So a lot of these patients, they get so sick that when they, when they present, they're already in overwhelming sepsis with severe tricuspid regurgitation. So, but one of the things that we do see is, is that if we can debulk, we can get rid of the, you know, try to get them bacteremic free, try to get rid of the sepsis early on. So 
we as a general principle try to get to these patients early on in their hospitalization instead of waiting for the sep you know trying to wait for the sepsis to completely run its course and then going after the, the vegetation so generally we're trying to angiovac these patients within about 72 hours of their our presentation if it's feasible uh, for us to do. obviously every patient's a little bit different but i think an angiovac principle is to try to think about these debulking early on one of the other questions that i get a lot from physicians is when you're debulking, you get this overwhelming inflammatory reaction. You know, you're, you're stirring up the pot, so to speak. You get, we haven't seen that. That's not something that we see. Our cardiac anesthesiologists who are running these cases, they see hemodynamic stability through all this. We're, 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 we just haven't seen that kind of overwhelming distributive picture where the, the pressure just goes and these patients just vasodilate. So that's been reassuring to us that we're not really stirring up more of an inflammatory milieu and, and you know, causing this cytokine surge. Uh, by doing this. So yeah. we think going in earlier on in their hospitalization, kind of decreasing the, the, the sepsis burden, the bacteremic burden, the vegetative burden uh, is probably more beneficial. Well, yeah, and I would think, you know, if I can add to that, I would, I would imagine that the, you know, you're going to have a surge response secondary to the sepsis itself. And so I can't imagine that a closed loop circuit with that little surface area, no, you know, with the heart-lung machine, it's generally the reservoir and the pump suckers mm -hmm. and the blood-air interface and all of these other variables, plus sternotomy, which sort of flares all of this up. This is a minimally invasive procedure with a relatively small surface area. Um, so I couldn't imagine that it would have a more, uh, it, would be, it would be a more impactful stimulus for inflammatory response than the underlying infection has on its own. That's my thought. Yeah, that's what we're seeing. So. Mm -hmm. Professor Stephanie? I really appreciated what you were saying about um, having the team approach and going about it as what's best for the patient and having a plan. And I was wondering when you started your program, did you just start when you saw a couple of cases here and there and brought it in or did you say, we're going to start uh, an angiovac program uh, and, and set it up and then start doing cases? So it, <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you the background on how we started our program and it'll kind of explain where we were. So when I got to Buffalo about five years ago, early on, uh, we started a PERT program. And so I'm the medical director of our, of our PERT program. And so we started doing pulmonary embolism interventions. Uh, and we were seeing about 250 consults in our first year. Now, we didn't do interventions on 250 patients. So it was only about 20%. But we were seeing these patients, and we saw a very small subset of patients that we couldn't treat because they had right heart thrombus in transit. And so these patients were either going on for surgery or we were, you know, were transitioning or transferring them to other institutions. And we were looking at our historical surgical mortality for these patients, which is in keeping with the published literature, was pretty high. Mm -hmm. So that's when uh, we started to say, well, is there a potential other therapy that we could, and we got in, that's when we approached angiodynamics and got angiovac in. So, you know, there's a surgeon that I work very closely with, uh, and so when we were getting in-serviced for the angiovac program, our clinical uh, uh, specialist, Kurt, was saying, oh, by the way, to my surgeon, you know, people are using angiovac for tricuspid endocarditis. Mm -hmm. So my surgeon horse collar tackled me and said, wait a minute, we can do this instead of uh, uh, doing open, you know, surgical procedures. What, let's start thinking about this. And he was the largest referral from the county hospital for these uh, IV drug use tricuspid endocarditis cases. So we got angiovac in. I got it in to be an adjunct to the PE program for right heart thrombus. And the first, I think, seven cases that we did were for tricuspid endocarditis because, wow. you know, because of that collaboration that when we got in service, it was me and the, my cardiothoracic surgeon side by side being in service. And we found this out. And so that's kind of how it morphed into. So now whenever we get a consult, whether it be myself or be him, we get together, we do a multidisciplinary uh, uh, evaluation, and it's kind of also morphed into the, the pacemaker and device lead explantation uh, team who are made up of thoracic surgeons who have now, anytime we get a consult, whether it comes from ECHO, which usually goes through me, or if it comes uh, from an outside hospital, it goes through them, we call each other and we collaborate and we say, what's the best thing for the patient at this time? So that's kind of how everything morphed. And to be honest with you, I think it's been a, a great environment, so nobody's left kind of on an island by themselves saying yes or no to a patient. When we, when somebody calls, when a patient calls, when a referring provider, referring hospital calls, they know they're getting an answer from a multidisciplinary team, not just from one provider saying yes or no. Right. 
That was very good. And yes. and you took my question, but it brought up another Tammy question for me. Tammy took my question. Okay, so, so that's, how, that's how it works. There's no fighting. There's no so, fighting. So you're reading my notes. Oh. <laughs> So uh, uh, on your PERT team, you know, your PE or pulmonary embolus response team uh, program, um, I'm not really allowed to involve Mark in this, but I'm hopeful that, uh, you know, in deference to your time as well, we'll send you this por the next portion of the video, unless you just want to watch it live, which you're certainly welcome to do. But w if we have your email, we can WeTransfer or Dropbox or something the video sure. of what we're going to do. But I think there is a big difference between, I think people need to differentiate between the chronic PE patient that's going to go in to, a, uh, to the operating room, be under profound hypothermia, circulatory arrest, and they're gonna go out and basically do, uh, do uh, 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 you know, removal of all of this chronic PE. They're almost like they're doing an end arterectomy on the pulmonary artery system to pull all of that out. And that's not what this is for. This is more for the, the, the acute pulmonary embolus patient, whether it be you know one side or the other or a saddle block embolus, or am I missing something? Uh, I see you look raising your eyebrows, so I'm not sure if, if, we're, if, if I'm saying something that you disagree with. No, I don't disagree. Uh, except for the fact that I do have to say, since we brought it up with me here, uh, that it has not been tested within, the Andrew cannula hasn't been tested in its existing form by our company yeah. for utilization within the pulmonary vasculature and may be considered outside the scope. Sure, so fair I, enough. So yeah. I have to leave that there from my perspective, but uh, Dr. Zlotnick, if you would like to chime in on that. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, I think that you can to a specific question. Well, I mean, I think the specific question he was asking was the difference between chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension and acute PE, which are two different, obviously, entities and, Animals, and yeah. treated differently. I mean, I, there's just a very small uh, amount of programs around the, the world that can, I feel, do a, a good job of doing a chronic you know, pulmonary thrombectomy versus the acute ca case where you're going in and doing a pulmonary embolectomy in an acute PE. And again, those are two completely different physiologic states. One's acute RV, you know, dysfunction from RV strain versus one which is more of a kind of a chronic pulmonary hypertension picture. So, right. um, yeah. So, so with that said, and, and Mark, you can just ignore this, okay? You're not listening to this because I'm going, I'm going off, the, I'm going rogue uh -oh. on Mark. So <laughs> what I want to tell people in the audience is that, and I really want your opinion on this later, is I've come up with a system by which let's just hypothetically say you have a patient who is on the floor, um, is status post maybe uh, cabbage surgery or some other procedure that was done, and uh, they're getting ready to be discharged home. They get up, start walking, and they drop to the floor, and it's, uh, they start resuscitative measures immediately, and it's suspected that this patient has had an acute pulmonary embolus, so they, uh, they don't know for sure, but there's something really bad going on. So they go ahead and initiate VA ECMO. So you get VA ECMO established and you get mechanical circulatory support and, and, and pulmonary support on the patient. But now what are you going to do? You're gonna take them to another room. And of course you could have another whole system available uh, to then do the angiovac procedure. But what I'm gonna show everybody is an idea that I came up with, which may not be a great, I've, I think it's a good idea, but I want people to actually help me appreciate whether this is just me being a little bit crazy or if it's really a good idea, but a single circuit system that can do both VA ECMO for the patient with the PE for mechanical circular support and then integrate into that same oh. system the angia back catheter very easily and go in, retrieve the saddle block embolus or whatever side, whatever the, the, the acute PE is, and then go back to regular VA ECMO in a single circuit, which makes it faster and easier. But you have to consider that if you think it's a PE or suspect it, you have to have a separate pack that has this particular piece attached to it. And that's what I'm gonna show the audience after we take a short break and do all that kind of stuff. And again, if you watch it live, great. If you don't, we're happy to send it to you via Dropbox. But I would like to get your opinion and also your perfusionist's opinion on what they think of this idea. Um, I think it's a great idea. I think it really is gonna work very well. We're gonna test it. 
and we're going to test it live. So if I fail, it's going to be horrible for me. But uh, but I think it's going to work out really well. And I'd just like to get everybody's opinion about what they think of it, except for Mark's. Thank you. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, from my standpoint, it's actually been described of using, you know, splicing in VA ECMO for Angiovac. Well, so, but you're splicing VA ECMO into the Angiovac. That's a little different. I'm talking about putting a patient on VA ECMO and right. then not splicing in the Angiovac, but it's already prepared with a certain side port, which I'll show you, which makes okay. it very easy to connect and then do the Angiovac and then remove that portion yeah. of it and maintain your VA ECMO. Uh, it sounds interesting. Yeah, I would obviously like to see what it, what it goes through. To, to kind of just go through a couple of the points of this, uh, what you're describing. If you're going to put somebody on VA ECMO for a saddle pulmonary embolism, that's not a standalone treatment. That's basically a, an adjunct or a way of stabilizing the patient until definitive therapy. And this has been shown out in study after study, which is that definitive therapy to treating the pulmonary embolism needs to be performed, whether it be a surgical thrombectomy, whether it be IV thrombolytic therapy, or whether it be mechanical thrombectomy. So I think the right thing to do is early on, especially in a massive PE, stabilize the patient, whether it be hemodynamic support, but then you need to do definitive therapy to treat the pulmonary embolism. So mm -hmm. what you're saying is all true because I think the wrong decision that's made is put somebody on VA ECMO and then wait. You, you, you're not waiting for recovery. You gotta do something to kind of help, help that recovery. So in that regards, now whether what your adjunct therapy of definitive treatment, whether it's one of those, that's kind of a dealer's choice to what your institutional expertise is, has. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we'll find out. And like I said, I'd really like you to show it to your perfusionist and uh, ask them to send me an email or something, uh, giving me their opinion about it and also the rest of my colleagues. I'd like to hear input on that as we move this ball forward. Before you go, though, I got a question for you. And I asked Mark this question earlier. And I think Stephanie and Tammy both have the same question. I can look at a, a city like Houston, and we're a big city. We have a lot of people. We're the third largest city in the country at this point in time. And yet, the number of angiovac cases that we do here in this town and the, general, and, the, and the metropolitan area as well, not just Houston proper, is significantly lower than what a place like Indianapolis does, which has a much smaller population accounting for the city and its geographical area. Why is that? Yeah, I mean, I think we, yeah, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head as far as, you know, the disparity in institutional practices around the country. And part of that's based on the hospitals, how the hospitals are uh, set up, who's doing what procedures. Is there institutional resources such that cardiothoracic surgery does the majority of these procedures and that that's been their historical and their outcomes have been good? Uh, looking at how many hospitals have the ability to even set up an angiovac program, what's the need in the in the in the uh, the community? Now, I would assume that you know I'm, that a, a city like Houston, that their IV drug use population is probably not that much smaller than Buffalo's, no so that the, probably not. the institution, you know, the community needs are there. So it's really kind of getting out there, educating clinicians of this device, the, the use, and you know. You have to also take a look that there's a lot of clinicians and a lot of hospitals. Let me put it this way. There's a lot of hospitals where you have a lot of uh, clinicians doing a small amount of procedures instead of having, you know, places where you have one or two hospitals where you have a lot of a, a few physicians doing a lot of procedures. Mm -hmm. And so you have physicians who become much more confident with large bore access, closure techniques, working with perfusionists. So mm -hmm. Angiovac is one of those procedures to me where it takes an interventional skill set with a surgical mindset, right? Mm -hmm. And so you need people who, who kind of fit that bill to take on these programs. And that's where I think identifying physician champions, having a multidisciplinary program and collaboration, once that framework's put in place, we'll start to see that I think more and more people will be treated this way. And it's going to be imperative on people like myself to get our data out there to kind of mm -hmm. show that we can successfully treat these patients with this. We can take patients from, from surgery, treating them medically, having just as good outcomes and potentially not having the adverse outcomes later on of, of device, uh, prosthetic device uh, infection. That's gonna change practice, but it's not gonna happen overnight. So well, those are, I think, are kind of the barriers. Yeah, and reducing the risk of sternotomy. Well, 
I personally, and I think I speak on behalf of all of my colleagues, Tammy, Stephanie here at the table, but everybody else out there, doing these kinds of educational programs, and I want to thank you so very much for taking so much of your time to do this, because I truly believe that as a, as a profession, as, an, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, a specialty within this realm, Perfusion can be the champion, so to speak, to get the word out there that this is a therapeutic modality that could really help a lot of patients. And I think that the more people, the more professionals in our arena that we get this word out to uh, is going to benefit everyone in particular and especially the patient at the end of the day, which is what we're all here to serve, you know, uh, uh, bar none. So, uh, so I wanna thank you uh, very much from the bottom of my heart sure. for taking so much time out of your very busy schedule to, uh, to educate us and to give us some extremely valuable information. I also wanna thank Mark because he did the exact same thing. He gave a tremendous overview on uh, the multitude of different uh, disease processes that can be addressed with the use of the angiovac catheter and uh, with the, with the uh, 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 essentially vacuuming of unwanted intravascular material, or removal of un unwanted intravascular material through the use of of, of suction or vacuum or whatever you want to call it. I can't think of a more fancy term to use. Vacuum's the best I can do. So, you know, we can all yeah. be called the Hoovers of the perfusion <laughs> world, I guess. Um, but, uh, or now I guess it's Shark now. They're the stronger. Dyson. Dyson's the best one. So we need to call you Dyson. But, uh, right. but with that said, well, thanks again. Thanks, 